All right, hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. This is going to be part five of the Abomination series. We're going to take a look at the crucifixion and the last words of Christ. All right, so there were some things that happened, and we should take a look at them. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 15. We'll start in verse 25. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucify two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. Now, I bet you the one on the right hand was the one that uh, acknowledged Christ. I think, yeah. and the one on the left was probably, well, we'll take a look at that later. Verse 28, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ the king of Israel, to send now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So there were three hours that there was darkness over the, the whole land. Darkness. Now remember something. There's going to be darkness in the future. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Also, there was darkness in Egypt during the days of Moses, just prior to the, um, you know, when Moses was uh, confronting Pharaoh to let his, let let my people go. Darkness. What is darkness? Well, Satan's called the prince of darkness, right? And the god of this world, of sin and wickedness. So, it's very symbolic. There was darkness over the whole land until the sixth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Christ is speaking Hebrew here. Now, if the book of Mark and the New Testament had been written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek, which some liars try to make you think that's true, it wouldn't say which is being interpreted. You see, he's speaking e Hebrew, and if this was originally written in Hebrew, it wouldn't say which is being interpreted. It wouldn't need to be, because if, they were, if it was written in Hebrew, the people speaking Hebrew would understand what he's saying here. But it says, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the New Testament was written in Greek. So when Christ spoke Hebrew on the cross, it had to say, which is being interpreted. So that the people who spoke Greek, which was the common language of commerce in these days, would understand what he's saying in Hebrew. So when people, I hope you understand what I'm saying. 
Christ could speak Hebrew. But I'll guarantee you, when Christ was talking to Pilate, he wasn't speaking to Pilate in Hebrew. I mean, it's possible, but it doesn't say he had a, uh, an interpreter. I'll guarantee you Pilate didn't understand Hebrew. He might have had an interpreter, but I'll bet you that Christ spoke to Pilate in Greek because that was the common language back then or possibly Latin. You know, people want you to think that Christ was speaking to Pilate in Hebrew. I don't think so. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. Guess what? The Jews that were hanging around didn't even understand what Christ was saying. He said, Eli, 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 lama sabachthani. And they're thinking, oh, he's calling Elias or Elijah. No, he wasn't. They didn't even understand Hebrew. And you're going to tell me that the New Testament was written in Hebrew? I don't think so. No, that, you know, a <laughs> bunch of idiots. Uh, in the book of Titus, it says, pay no heed to Jewish fables. What can I tell you? Paul knew what he was talk, writing about. Oh, that's right. They don't like Paul either. So, all right. Verse 36. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. He gave up his living spirit. And the veil of the temple was rent. It was ripped. And the veil of the temple was rent, rent in twain. It was torn in half, people. From the top to the bottom. Why is that significant? Well, normally if something's going to rip, you know, you'd think it would rip from the bottom to the top. No. It ripped from the top, God in heaven, Father, to the bottom, to mankind and his sinfulness, reconciling us through Christ back to the Father. Now, this veil of the temple, this was the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, like I mentioned in a previous study, with a rope around, tied around his ankle, with bells on, to let him know that if God accepted his sacrifice. And guess what? Because the veil of the temple rent from the top, God the Father, to the bottom, to man, earth, God, Jesus was letting them know the Holy of Holies is not necessary anymore. Christ was the sacrifice on this Passover, not Easter. Big difference. Verse 39. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. A Roman centurion had more sense than the scribes who copied the scriptures and the high priests that served in the temple. A Roman centurion with no formal biblical training had more sense than the scribes and the Pharisees. All right, let's take a look at the book of John. Verse uh, John 19, chapter 19, and verse 12. Um, and from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Ah, but we're always told by these lying churches and preachers that uh, Rome killed Jesus, right? No. Pilate sought to release Jesus. 
And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You see, the Jews are accusing Pilate. You let him go, we're going to accuse you of treason against Rome, which is punishable by death. And don't think that point was not lost on Pilate. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Ah, see, written in Greek, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. See, that's so people could understand the Hebrew, but it's pavement in the Greek. And it was the preparation of the Passover. You see, the Passover lamb's getting ready to be sacrificed. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Remember that. The Jews said, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he went bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Ah, in the Greek, place of a skull, in the Hebrew Golgotha. Why? Because New Testament was Greek. Where they crucified him and two others, and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. All right, I think it's uh, time to close out this study. We're going to do uh, the next part. Let's see, the next part will be part six. All right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.